Thank you for coming. This is a panel discussion uh, about digital signal processing in headphones, stigma or solution. Uh, this is an interesting topic because we're seeing uh, DSP, uh, digital signal processing, being put into products, audio products, even by audiophile companies more and more. And audiophiles are sometimes res resistant to any amount of processing. It's been historically the case. Um, yet, I mean, I, I don't know about you, I'm aging. I think we're all aging. I'm 48 years old. The hearing is not going to get better as the years go by. Um, some companies are using DSP, for example, to even do correction for hearing loss. Um, yet the people who might need it the most, including myself, maybe we're the most resistant to technology when maybe we're the ones who most need it. But that's not obviously the only thing that DSP is used for. Uh, we have some panelists here um, from companies, and the reason that they're here is because they worked with uh, companies who have made traditional audiophile headphone products acoustically tuned um, but then are now also implementing DSP into some of these products, and uh, rather aggressively so in some cases, which is pretty exciting. So I'm gonna let them introduce themselves, starting with Greg Stidson. Yeah, hi, I'm Greg Stidson. I work uh, for Lenbrook, and we have uh, three brands in the industry. We have PSB speakers, uh, and of course, we make headphones. Uh, we have NAD Electronics, and we also make headphones under that brand. And then we have Blue Sound, which is the multi-room High resolution audio system. So we do a lot of work with DSPs and we have been pretty aggressively bringing it into the uh, headphone range. Hi, my name is Dan Wiggins. I'm with Periodic Audio and while we don't offer a DSP solution today, I have deep, deep experience with it. Um, I was co-founder of a company called Doppler Labs, which did a lot of a DSP and augmented hearing, been doing hearing aids for years, um, and working with a lot of high-end Fortune 100, Fortune 500 companies in terms of developing DSP and smart hearing, smart uh, entertainment systems uh, around headphones and things like that. So, too much DSP. <laughs> I'm Mark Cohen with Odyssey. I think my title is someone remotely important there. <laughs> and uh, most, most of you already know us from all of our headphones. Thank you for being here, by the way. So uh, thank you, guys. Uh, I want to start with Mark because uh, they, Odyssey um, has been very aggressive about implementing DSP into their products, almost hybridizing some of their products. Um, they developed a high-end planar magnetic in-ear called the LCD i4. It's, what is it, $2,500? Correct. Um, and you can listen to it as is, and it's a wonderful uh, in-ear monitor. Um, or you can use something called a cipher cable, which has DSP in it, to improve its sound. But you guys are also putting your DSP in Rune for almost your entire product line. Yes. Um, and then you developed an entire DSP headphone with Mobius. Can you talk about how DSP has moved into the Odyssey family products and how you're seeing it used? Well, I guess for Odyssey, our journey first started with uh, Apple and the Lightning Connector and the fact that we had to put active electronics inside the headphone or the dongle uh, to be able to work with lightning. So that actually gave us the DSP where we really got started with all this. And then once we got with DSP, and we have our own in-house DSP engineering, unlike a lot of other companies in the industry. Uh, so we were able to take that and, and tune due to our planar drivers. Uh, from that, we've gone on to other products uh, such as the iSigns, which have their own version of the Cypher cable. Uh, now we're you're probably familiar with our new Mobius, which is our 3D gaming headphone. And that has a huge amount of DSP processing in it, as well as microprocessors. Uh, you know, that, uh, that does 5.1 and 7.1 inside the headphone. It actually looks like a regular sound card to your PC when you plug it in. Additionally, because we put a, uh, uh, a gyroscope and accelerometer in it. It has all the positional information also put into the headphone. And not only that, we can talk about this later, but we also can send that positional audio back to the computer. So the computer can then take that data and do something with it. And that something with it, quote unquote, could be a great variation of things. If you're, well, for example, how many of you are PC gamers here? All right, so you're familiar with keyboard, uh, keyboard binding. You could actually de uh, decide to have some of the head movements bind to the keyboard commands. So for example, anyone play PUBG? You could do this and have the map show up. 
If you're doing a, a reload, for example, all that can be done by head movements. If you have physical problems, we can send commands to a computer to give you uh, instructions for that problem. Uh, so there's many, many things that can be done, and we can talk about that more at length as we go through this. Uh, anyway, I'm, I don't want to take up all this. <laughs> no, I mean, this is a discussion about, though, especially with the traditional audio, because you're doing a lot of things with, for the audio files as well, um, that, that uh, I find, again, a very aggressive sort of move in a DSP. With, That's true. Yeah. And it's possible, you know, we can take the DSP platforms we have in our products, and now we have enough horsepower available in DSP as manufacturers that we can actually supply a, a really good room simulation. Not like what used to be in the past, but we can actually nicely sample, for example, Abbey Road Studios. If you're a Steely Dan fan, how about Village Recorder Studio D? We could give you that in the headphone. And that's something that really has not been possible before. So with the amount of memory now, now we can build in and the horsepower, these are now things that are now doable. Additionally, which I'd like to touch on something that uh, Jude was talking about at the very beginning here, and that is about people with any kind of uh, hearing inaccuracy. And just as an anecdotal point, you know, I talk to many, many people who buy our headphones and otherwise, and I would say, once again anecdotally, probably about 30% or perhaps more of the people that we communicate with have some sort of hearing issue. That could be something like tinnitus, uh, but often it's v people who have different hearing on each side. Some people have a real problem, for example, at a certain high range uh, or low frequency range. All these can be resolved by DSP and finally make music much more enjoyable and truly listenable for a great, great many people. So DSP and I go back way too long in audio processing. Um, in the mid-90s, I worked for Siemens Medical, doing some ultrasound work, but then we, uh, which, believe it or not, has a lot of DSP in the audio world. Uh, it's amazing how much diagnostic uh, decisions are made by a, by a sonographer based upon what they hear, not based upon what they see. And the information you're feeding them is a lot of the Doppler information for, for vascular flow, blood flow in, in the body that'll create a little you hear kind of a thing. And they can actually determine just by listening what's going on inside of a body rather than, than looking at it. Um, and then I moved into Siemens Medical doing hearing aids, and that was at, uh, the good time to do it because they were just starting out with some of the original on semi hybrids that were coming in. Um, and it became very apparent to me the power of DSP and signal processing in general uh, for an audiophile world. But fast forward to today, uh, I think how many of you actually listen to music from your cell phone? Okay, so every one of you has already bought into the whole concept of DSP because you're downloading digital files and they're all processed digitally in a studio. Nobody's listening direct to disc masters much anymore, especially when they're moving. So you've already all bought into DSP, whether you believe it or not. I tell that to a lot of audio files who say they issue DSP, and they're like, oh, well, I never thought of that. I'm like, yeah, well, now you have. Um, so that is just a matter of how much you want to use. I see DSP enabling things that aren't normal. Uh, it now becomes less important to make sure the frequency response of a transducer is exactly perfect to where you want it to be. It's now more important to make sure the transducer never distorts and it can just give you all the SPL you want and any given frequency you want and use DSP to shape what the frequency response should be and even make a variable frequency response based upon not just preference but based upon amplitude of what you're doing. You can now wedge alignments. I'm working with one client developing a new over ear headphone that we have an insanely tiny volume behind the transducer. It's less than seven cc's on a 40 millimeter transducer. And I don't know how many of you know what a CC is, a cubic centimeter. Um, volume be behind most closed headphones transducers are 50 or 60 cc's. We have something that's insanely small, but we're using DSP to compensate for it. So we make a very small, slim profile, very attractive headphone that plays a lot lower and deeper than should normally be available. So signal processing allows you to actually break some fundamental rules by leveraging power elsewhere, in this case, electrical power, and processing power. But it, it opens up the world in terms of accessibility of music to people, how you hear it, what you can hear, and what kind of format you want when you're out and about. 
And I think that's one of the reasons we're seeing a huge explosion in uh, music consumption worldwide, especially streaming, is it's easier to consume media because of signal processing, whether it's done in your cell phone, whether it's done in the studio, whether it's done in your headphone. All those have brought together the ability for people to consume great sounding music wherever they are, and that's just why we're seeing this industry kind of take off. Now, Greg, uh, obviously, you know, Paul Barton, uh, who works with you, is, is, is very big into using DSP to reach a frequency target, a frequency response target That's right. in his headphones. I mean, we're very fortunate to be a Canadian company and have access to the National Research Council, uh, which does a lot of basic research, and it's government funded, and because we're a Canadian company, we can actually tap into a lot of that. And uh, Paul Barton, our founder of PSB Speakers, uh, is, I would say, really uh, an expert in acoustics and has worked there over the many, many years uh, and has drawn on a lot of the basic research that has been done there. And um, Paul's primary concern with headphones is getting a correct target response that uh, actually uh, sounds natural. I mean, that's Paul's complete philosophy is the music should sound real to life, it should be natural, uh, and that's his primary goal. And he's been working uh, for a few years now on uh, an improved uh, uh, cheek coupler so he can get more accurate measurements. Uh, he's created a target curve which we call room feel which does put some of the room uh, uh, response back into the headphone. If you listen to a completely flat measuring headphone it sounds very bright and has very little bass. Uh, so you do have to add back in not only the uh, effects of the pinna, your outer ear in the case of an over ear headphone uh, but you also have to uh, uh, take into consideration the resonance of the ear canal. and So that's a lot of his focus has been there. And I think what's interesting is that we probably wouldn't have thought of putting DSP in headphones uh, seven or eight years ago, but the mobile phone market has now made DSPs that are very energy efficient, very miniaturized, and very powerful. And uh, so our newest headphones are wireless Bluetooth headphones. Uh, we're using the Aptex HD chip from uh, Qualcomm, which is a very sophisticated chip, very good sound quality. And um, we've been able to really optimize, rather than using uh, uh, um, mechanical tuning methods, uh, we can take that mechanical tuning and just really polish it up and hit the curve exactly using DSP. So uh, right now, that's the uh, application that we have for DSP in headphones. Well, the audiophiles, I think, uh, are the, the, you know, the fear I know with me with processing has always been, you know, the, the, the reason that I think we have a more purist mindset in a place like this, right, in an audio show, is because we're trying to leave the music as untouched. That's fidelity, right? We're trying to leave the music right. as untouched, as unvarnished, I see Dan already laughing, but uh, but that's that's the mentality, yeah. right? We're trying, but but is there with today's technology, is, is there still? I mean, was that ever a reasonable fear? Uh, I think it was, right? I mean, no. when, you don't think it ever was? No. Dan um, wants to varnish it now. Well, no. I mean, so no. So here's 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 the thing. What you listen to is an interpretation of an interpretation of an interpretation of an event that never happened. Flat out. You ever been to a recording session? Yeah. I've done lots of them, okay? Drummer comes in, click track, lays down 8, 10, 12, 15 takes, the drum set. Basis of listening to that head. Everybody's layering on, listening to what else happened. They're doing 10, 15, 20 cuts in the entire song. Yeah, multi-mono, not multi really stereo. Exactly. Right? They're, they're not playing together. And then more importantly, so that's an event that never happened, the concept that they actually played together. doesn't exist. Then they all sit down, usually with the producer and the, and the mix engineer, and they slice and dice, say, hey, let's, let's use uh, measure 7 through 17 from this cut, but follow it up with this cut and then this cut to finish off the rest of the song. They create an interpretation of what they believe it should have been. Then they hand that off to a mastering engineer who sits down in a big room with a nice pair of high-end speakers. He goes, hmm, I think it needs a little more of this and a little less of this. And I think I need to pan this little wire and things like that. It's done. Then they hand that piece of music off to us who make the headphones. And we get to decide what is the curve that's going to be. So at the end of the day, what you're listening to as what you consider purist is an interpretation of an interpretation of an interpretation of an event that never happened. So I have a big issue when people talk about, we have to talk about the purity, the accuracy of the event. 
It never happened at the end of the day. Very, very few recordings are direct to disc, completely unmolested. Those are the only ones you can ever talk about. It. Most of it, it doesn't matter. So a lot of people get hung up in this fear of, oh, I gotta be afraid of, you know, I'm not being completely accurate, I'm not being faithful to the music. The music is whatever you want it to be because it never happened. So be more comfortable with it, be more accepting of what it is. And once you understand that, you go, oh, then it's more important that I enjoy it rather than I try to recreate something that didn't exist, right? That's always been my take on it. Well, I EQ. I mean, I, yeah. I'm not. Resi I mean, I actually. Exactly. Use I actually use. I, I use a lot of EQ. I'm playing devil's advocate here. So, yeah. so I mean, but, but I'm not resistant to equalizers. Yeah. And, exactly, and, and that yeah. that's the point. At that point, you make it good for you because at the end of the day, we're in an industry. We're Hollywood. We're just selling fantasy. We're selling happiness. People have to buy clothes. You got to buy food. You got to buy medical. You probably need shelter. You don't need stereos. You don't need speakers. You don't need music. You buy it because you're happy. So get something that makes you happy and is reasonable enough that you listen to it. That sounds like a really good violin. That sounds like a really good jam and drum, drum solo, things like that. That's where I come down on it. Right. It doesn't really fly necessarily with a lot of you know, purists and audiophiles at these shows, but you know what? I'm happy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but how many of you actually create your own music? Uh, do you do mixing, producing, mastering? How many of you? Right, so. So then, the, the one guy here. <laughs> <laughs> so here's one of the things that happens to the, uh, to the great unwashed is that when they hear some recording of, let's say, it's got upright bass, piano, guitar, saxophone, whatever, the general assumption by the public is typically that if this is done really well, all these instruments are reproduced as accurately as possible when the reality is that when you actually go to mix all these things together, they take up too much space in certain equalization bands. Mm -hmm. So people start making room using equalization for the different instruments. So you may find, if I've got piano and electric guitar happening at the same time, I may be taking between, let's say, eight to about 2,500 kilohertz, slightly down on the piano, so the electric guitar is now audible in that mix. So you never, it's really rare that you ever hear, how can I put it, the complete acoustic spectrum mm -hmm. of everyone's instrument in a, in a regular studio recording. Mm -hmm. Now that's not true of, of the higher end uh, acoustic recordings or whatever, but for most uh, practical multi-mono or studio recordings, mm -hmm. this is what happens. Now, leading on to this, which once again ties into something that you'd mentioned earlier. So when we started with dealing with DSP, uh, because a lot of our customers use our products for mastering. Hmm. So they needed to have our product that would translate well. And normally for us, we have a model called the LCD-X, which most producers tend to use. It translates real well to the real world. That doesn't mean it is the most accurate sounding transducer Correct. in the galaxy. That means whatever they mix on that, when that mix is played back, it will sound the same on your Wilson Sophia's as your Yamaha NS10s, or somewhat reasonably close. Uh, or not, maybe on unreasonably close. Nothing sounds good on those. <laughs> okay. Well, did they have the tissue paper mod? Yeah. All right. Uh, what we ended up doing was we've realized, especially in the studio monitor situation, there really is no way for these users to go from one studio to the next studio mm -hmm. and have the same sonic response in every studio. So then what we did is we developed a product called Reveal, which runs as a uh, plug-in for Logic, uh, Pro Tools, you name it. Also, it's used in Rune, in Rune's player, as uh, Jude mentioned earlier. The advantage of this is, and once again, this talks to something uh, Greg mentioned earlier by Paul, that we generate a target response. So this reveal generates a target response, and it could be, it's ours, but it could be PSBs, it could be the, the Harman target, whatever, but what we do is we adjust it so it can be the same on every one of our headphone models. So if one of our customers is working on a pair of LCD-3s, let's say George Massenburg, uh, he's very famous, he uses a 3s. If he's working on that and he wants to send that project to be mastered uh, by Metropolis Studios, by Tony Cousins, for example, in London, they've got X's. He would have the exact same target response that he hears on either headphone. Mm 
in any studio. And that's something you can't do over any other studio monitors. Mm -hmm. So that's something we decided to do uh, for the studio workers. And once again, that was an outgrowth of what we started to learn in dealing with all the DSP. Is there still an advantage though, Mark? That's an interesting question. So if I can take a three and yes. reach a target curve or a four and reach a target curve or an X and reach a target curve, is there still an advantage to buying one model over the other? Like, I mean, there, I imagine there are other performance yeah. advantages due to the transducer differences as well? Because we're talking strictly frequency domain here. Yeah, well actually, so there's two differences. Or is there time domain stuff? Yeah, so there, there's, there's time and frequency domain, but also there is closed back versus open back domain. And uh, maybe I'm talking too much on the studio side of things, but what surprised us early on was that the vast majority of the producers and mastering engineers use open back headphones. Oh, we originally thought everyone would have closed back because we're in a studio, they want the isolation. No, they want the open back. Uh, they have more accurate bass response when they use the open back headphones. However, we do have some customers like Elliot Shiner, for example, who's done a lot of work. He loves XCs, which is our closed back model. So he's able to take his work on his XCs using our Reveal plugin and have that be able to be translated by anyone who's using any of our other models. So it does open for anyone in the, what, the Music Maker Galaxy to be able to move their projects from one house to another house. And that includes someone sitting outside here with an iPad Pro and a pair of our iSign 10 in-ears and wants to send that project to George to, to, re, uh, to remix. And that's not something you get anywhere else. But we're able to do that because of the huge inroads that have been made in the development of DSP and all the horsepower available. You do bring up an interesting point though, Jude. Um, we are talking frequency domain, frequency response in particular. And that's where DSP is really dominant right now. A lot, if you have two speakers that measure exactly the same, they can still sound radically different. Yep for frequency response. There's distortion characteristics, total harmonic distortion, intermodulation distortion. Uh, there's also you know, just noise floor of the transducer. There's waterfall. You can have the exact same distortion curves and the exact same frequency response curves, but if your, your, your cumulative spectral decay, your waterfall plot is different. It will sound different. There's, there's a lot of other things that go into it. There's also just dynamic range scaling. So those are some of the issues that DSP cannot solve because there's the, old act, um, um, there's the old truth of when you're equalizing a room, you can't fill a hole. Yeah. If you have a null in, in your room response, it doesn't matter how much yeah. EQ you put into it, you're not filling the null, it's a, it's a physical notch. Same thing with distortion. If your transducer is beginning to distort, you can't use DSP to stop distorting. The only thing you could do is turn it back down, which stops the problem, but then you've eliminated the signal. So DSP will not solve most of, your, most of the other problems. So there's still a need for different transducers and different levels of product even, you know, entry level to high end. They can all sound sonically have the same presentation from a frequency stand standpoint, but they'll have different performance characteristics because of the differences in the transducer and the system as a whole. Right, so you can't DSP fully an no. LCD2 into an LCD4. Yep. Let, it, I guess I'm asking Mark that too. Yep. Right? No, yeah. no, not yeah. completely, but yeah. sure. as close enough for folk music. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. But actually, uh, Dan leads into another problem, which is probably something that most of you lot. can readily identify with and immediately raises a red flag for problems with DSP processing. Yes. Uh, and that is, originally, the idea in DSP was for room correction. And everyone originally thought, oh, the magic bullet is, I'm going to generate an inverse frequency response curve to fix my room. So in other words, if you had a bump, of uh, 3 dB at 120 hertz, you'd simply generate the reverse of that. And so then what would happen is all you really do when you're talking in the digital domain is you're moving stuff back in time and now you get comb filter effects. Mm -hmm. And that's what can really cause the audible problems that can build up. And the other problem you have that is more difficult for DSP to solve right now, which Dan also alluded to, is simply the energy storage in the room. Yep, you can't kill that. And that maybe that's Dan and, and Greg, something they can really you know, talk more on. Sure, I'd love to talk to that one. We've recently been working with Dirac, uh, the mm. Swedish uh, yeah. company who have a very sophisticated approach to room correction. Uh, we haven't used it in our headphones, but we are using it, uh, their live room correction on our NAD electronics. 
and you know, it's exactly as you say. Their approach is that the type of filtering that you use depends on where the direction of the resonance problem. So that there's a different kind of filter for sound bouncing off the ceiling than there is for sound bouncing off the wall. Off the back wall, maybe you don't do anything. So it's, uh, it's using the right filter, knowing when not to use a filter. Uh, they, mo they change the shape of the energy in the room to try to get it to line up in an impulse response. Uh, so there's a lot of sophistication possible using DSP. But, you know, from my point of view, the audibility of DSP, first of all, it's you have to get your analog signal to become digital and your digital signal back to analog again, because that's how we hear. Those are the things that probably create the biggest amounts of distortion. The DSP can be very transparent in the middle, although you have to mm. be correcting the right things and you have to use the right mathematics. So, yes, <laughs> uh, that's the big one. <laughs> that's a really big one. Math, so, math. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's a very, you know, it's, it's a lot more sophisticated than putting a couple drivers in a box and listening to it. It's, yeah. uh, there's a lot of science that goes into uh, the implementation of DSP. Absolutely, absolutely. The, uh, the DSP as a whole, it, it, you know, like room, like Mark's saying, if, if you have a bump at 3 dB at 60 hertz in your room because you have a, a standing wave kind of issue, turning it down 3 dB, all instead of, instead of getting a bong, you're going to get a bong. You're going to get the same ring. It's just lower amplitude. You haven't solved the problem. So I tell people a lot of times, DSP is great in some areas. In others, it's much like the ABS system in your car. It only kicks in when you started skidding, right? ABS kind of pulls you back over the edge from dying. Um, DSP can kind of sometimes do the same thing like it, but the problem's already happened. You've already experienced the issue. The best it can do is kind of try to make it not as bad, but you already have a bad situation. So there's issues to already deal with in the first place. It's, not, it's by no means a cure-all. Well, this is an interesting discussion now, so let's get back to headphones. <laughs> so, so now let's go to the, uh, mm -hmm. not the recordings that didn't, you know, the events that didn't happen. Let's go to the ones that did, because yeah. I'm trying to, now I'm trying to attack this from the more pure standpoint. So now let's talk about a recording that was made mm -hmm. purely acoustically. You know, you know like David Chess given his recordings, he does that, it's all recorded mm -hmm. once. Uh, and now let's talk about advancing headphones, because, you know, all, 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 all three companies here are trying to make better headphones, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and you're making better transducers. So I guess one message here is, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that at the end of all this processing, there has to be some really good transducers, right? <laughs> so, so but, but do you see, for a guy who listens only to the events that did happen, uh, uh, any advantages a, a, with the headphones as they go forward in advance with mm -hmm. DSP? Do you get what I'm saying? Like, yeah, and, totally, and do totally. you envision a future of, 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 of the very best headphones going forward involving them. I mean, are we yes. is processing part of our future inevitably to make it, not just because of the way technology is mm -hmm. going, but, but to actually to improve our experience? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, so the case I, I talked about earlier, I got a, a consumer, uh, a client who's making a headphone with way too small of a rear volume. They're doing it on purpose because I designed a, a phenomenal transducer for them that has the ability to displace a crap ton of air, to put it literally. You know, for, for it's, it's an over your headphone, um, it's an amazing performer. Normally, you would look at it and go, this just can't work. You're not going to have anything below 700 hertz because the rear chamber is too, too small. DSP is long as to equalize and compensate and take care of it. We're also using DSP for a much greater um, uh, transparency experience, you know, like PSV products have it. You can turn it on and you can hear the outside world. Right. What they've done is they spent, you know, tens of thousands of man hours of engineers and research scientists coming up with a system where it also will trans basically add what they call transparency. So you can hear the outside world through closed back headphones by just clicking a button. And it's to the point where you're hearing my voice right now and you put the headphones on and you click transparency and it sounds like there's not even anything there. It's done all the right HRTFs with multiple mics and everything like that. So it allows a person to um, eliminate some problems that are brought in, number one, by doing with headphones, like HRTF issues and things like that, with like what the Mobius does, which by the way, is phenomenal how well it does it, especially the head tracking kind of thing. It's kind of spooky to turn your head and not have, a, <laughs> not have the sound go. It's like, wait, I got headphones, that's supposed to happen. Um, but that uses a lot of DSP. That's a lot of DSP. <laughs> no. But so it, it allows you to integrate to the world easier. So in, in some aspects, it, it'll solve some problems like the base EQ and things like we only do with the headphones, but it allows, it makes it easier to be an audiophile purist in more places. 
You're not locked down to, well, this is where I have to go when I want to listen to music. I now have the ability to listen to music as a purist wherever I am and have a pretty good experience. I can add room effects into it. I can make it sound like I'm in a studio or in a specific volume. I can turn on transparency. I can listen to the outside world and not have to turn off the music when I want to talk to somebody. So it opens up that whole big aspect to it, especially if the purist is really interested in music and not just a, a gearhead but right. a music person, then I think that's a huge boon right there. And those aren't even really doing music type processing, but it's allowing you to augment the music type processing. If you understand what I'm talking about, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Well, also, leading on what Dan was just talking about, uh, have any of you heard our Mobius headphone? Okay, the ones that haven't, I would suggest you come by for a demo. Yes, I don't do cool. that for a sales pitch, rather. But just to really illustrate the advantage of something DSP is now able to bring to you yep. that it makes the product more real or more <laughs> accurate in the sense that we have this head tracking and, um, and positioning built in. Mm -hmm. So here's your current problem with headphones. If I'm talking to you right now, I turn my head, you come along with me. That's not how the real world works. That's not how the speakers work in your room. Yeah. With our headphones, because we had the head tracking built in, which we're able to do because of the DSP, we now are able to position the source of the audio within that space. So as if you're still talking to me, as I turn my head, you still come from that same direction, just like real life. Mm -hmm. So while normally our demos tend to be for video, whether it's movies with surround sound or for the games, if you listen to regular stereo audio, with our 3D head tracking on, it is quite a different experience, mm -hmm. especially if you're just really used to headphones. If you're more used to speakers, this will sound far more yeah. natural to yeah. you because it is just like the real world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's a, yeah. You do the demo. We did a video on it on HeadFi about the yeah. head tracking, about how the world doesn't move with you when you <laughs> rotate, but you rotate within it. It's not all about you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, so, it anch so what he's saying is that anchor is the image. So if you have a, a non-surround image, it's, a stereo, it's essentially a stereo right. uh, pair. And, and when you move, the stereo pair stays there. But then if you do the surround, it's 7.1 to yeah. 5.1, uh, then all of the surround uh, speakers, again, are anchored and you're moving within right. the acoustic. It, it's, it's, uh, it's very compelling. Yeah. Right. Now, as Dan mentioned about the HTRFs, we actually have a separate app that we provide with the product, and it enables you to actually, for one thing, you can see the wireframe of your head moving. And you'll be amazed when you think your head is absolutely straight, how much it's actually moving. Because mm -hmm. you do that as a human being to constantly place things in its space. That's what we do to stay alive. That's part of our ability to recognize danger or other problems around us. Uh, we actually also give you the ability to make up your own HTRFs. In other words, you can measure your intracranial and interall distances and the room size and put those into the Mobius headphone. So you can have a much more, how can I put it, personalized listening experience than you could have any other way. Yeah, I think some people will be willing to listen to the Mobius in head tracking surround mode with just yeah. music. Yeah. Uh, and some, you know, won't. That's uh, correct. Because, yeah, yeah. because you'll, you'll hear it's different. Yeah. Uh, but I think some will really prefer it, and, and, and then those who don't just simply won't. But it's interesting. So, so the answer to the question, though, is I'm still seeking it, is like, it, it, can we improve the experience for even the purists mm -hmm. here? the guys who are going up and listening to the two channel stuff, not just going into the can jam room. And you know, can we improve the headphone listening experience just from a pure fidelity standpoint, for example? Mm -hmm. um, because that's, that is the goal, whether you agree uh, yeah, we're pursuing yeah. it correctly or not, is to, to sure. yeah. Well, I think you can, because you can add in room, EQ, you can add in the sense of realism, the room feel. You can add in the, the room simulation. You can add that kind of stuff in. You can add the HRTFs where it's not like, you know, everybody's like a headphone is right here is where the image is, unless it's a really good pair of headphones, and then it's here. <laughs> uh, you know, kind of a thing. It's like, oh my God, I can hear things from my ear to ear. That's a good set. Of, well, I'm being honest. I, I make headphones. This is, this is honest truth. But it's never going to have that sense of space of a, a pair of speakers where, oh, the image is panning across this entire area. But you can when you start adding in some room fill, when you start adding in some room EQ, you start adding in that kind of processing. 
that I think makes headphones much more applicable to guys who are used to speakers and are like, well, I have one place in the world where I go to listen to music. And it's my back office because that's where it's set up. Well, now, hey, I could take some nice headphones and I could go elsewhere. It's not going to be the same because I'm still going to lose some of the chest thump and some of the other visceral things. But it's 85% of that. And that's great when I'm out mowing the lawn or when I'm out walking down the park. I, that's good enough for what I want. So I think it opens them up and it allows them, like I said earlier, to experience their music in more places. And that's really the whole part of the matter, right? That actually raises another interesting question because we're uh -oh. talking about us here, but what about the generation that's coming up? Most of whom, you know, the young yeah. kids, they're not using speakers much. Yeah, they're all headphones. They're all headphones. Yeah. And so imaging on headphones to them might actually be quite normal, mm -hmm. right? It's not unnatural to them. That's Absolutely. just how they kind of were raised. It. I mean, how will they respond to, uh, oh, look, we took it out of your head now. Um, you know, so the experience to them of having two speakers, which might be natural to everybody in this room, might be quite unnatural to somebody who, uh, you know, a teenager now who, who's kind of grown up listening to, uh, it's very interesting. Well, I guess you could switch it off. But that, that's, uh, that, that's another interesting question is tuning acoustically. So that's very interesting. So some headphones have DSP to reach a target, but if you use them passively, if they provide a passive option, mm -hmm. it can be bad. It can be atrocious because the, um, uh, the one of the headphones I use is uh, called a Parrot Zik. Uh, um, and uh, there's a passive mode. I don't even know why it exists. Don't use it. <laughs> it's so bad. And uh, active mode, it's actually, it's yeah. actually a nice wireless headphone. Yeah. But then you plug it in passively if your battery dies, and it's just, it's, it's, it's a nightmare. It's nightmarishly bad. Because it was tuned entirely in the DSP. It yep. wasn't tuned acoustically. Now, Odyssey, now, I'm not sure, where, where are you with your last two models? Uh, the PSP I think there's a little bit more uh, of the EQ in the DSP than right, previously. Right. Uh, but Paul always tries to get and the other thing we can do with DSP is much more effective uh, noise cancellation. So sure. a lot of people that may not listen to headphones all the time, they do listen to them on airplanes because the noise level is so bad or when they're mowing mm -hmm. the lawn. Or, and that's a really nice feature. Um, it sounds a lot better to kill that noise than to mix it in with the music. Yep. So it is a better experience, even though the noise cancellation from a purist point of view does change the response a little bit. You can't get it quite exactly the same, but you know, Paul has spends a lot of time making sure that all three modes that would be passive, active, and noise canceling line up very, very closely. And right. like you say, it's not true of all noise. No, canceling. it's not true yeah. of all. Yeah. And yeah, so so you're saying the last two models, the the PSB M4U8, the NAD Viso HP70, these have probably are more. There's more DSP in there. For there's the a tuning. little bit more DSP in it, I would say, than in the M4U2. Uh, okay, all right. The M4U2 is actually done, uh, the EQ is done analog. Uh, is it gonna get to the point, because with Odyssey, you're still tuning primarily acoustically, and then you have all the DSP that you can optionally apply. So are we, are we gonna move to a part, are you gonna eventually move to a place where the transducers still have to be good, but the DSP is just gonna kind of take over the lion's share of, do you, you, you understand what I'm saying here? Yeah, I because, do, yeah. but I actually see that as a different problem and a different question. And I think it's much more complicated for everybody. And I, the reasons for that are, number one, just talking about the audio quality. Uh, you know, we still believe your transducer has to be great to begin with. Yep. You know, there's only a, so much barbecue you can add, uh, <laughs> you know, or lipstick on a pig, or DSP on a pig, maybe that's yeah, what exactly. we have, there we go. Uh, that you can add. So one of the advantages we have as a planner driver is that inherently we typically have lower total harmonic distortion, which means you can add more DSP correction before distortion or other problems occur. That's, that's not necessarily true of, let's say, balanced armature drivers, yeah. you know, which had maybe 10, 10 times the harmonic distortion. So you can't add as much correction as you could with a planar driver. So we'll, we still believe that you have to have the basic speaker as good as possible, and then you can tweak it a bit, but rather it's not so much tweaking, but rather what is the real use case for everyone? At the very beginning, we talked about maybe 30% of the people in this room have some kind of hearing issue, whether it's tinnitus, whether it's difference in left and right balance, whether it's frequency response issue or whatever. We now can make DSP really usable and enjoyable audibly for these kinds of customers. Additionally, there's another part to this DSP, and that is if you see what we've done with the Cyper cable, we basically take an amp and DSP all in one little dongle, and that's it. 
There's no more stack of gear or whatever. So that's an interesting use case for people that want a great, how can I put it, integrated movable or traveling mm -hmm. solution for their product. So it's not just a, a question of is DSP the holy grail for speaker or headphone development or whatever. Uh, it's just another tool that the manufacturers can use to make products better or more able to use for everyone in the market. To your point, Jude, about <clears throat> can, d does the transducer really matter anymore? And um, I think for the purists, it always will simply because they're purists and because we obsess about things like that, right? We obsess about the, the, the sound of which cable is, you know, the guys who do the little one watt clapping amps and things like that, right? <laughs> little tube amps, sure, sure. as I call them. Um, but for the general public, <laughs> you like that? Yeah, I, like that. <laughs> I used that burning amp last week at San Francisco. <laughs> it went over well with some, some others like, um, anyway. Um, for the general consumer though, absolutely. Um, and I, I would point you no further than Sonos. So I worked at Sonos for several years. I did all their transducers. Uh, the goal there as the transducer guy and um, the lead there was to make a transducer that moved a massive amount of air. Didn't matter if it was a woofer, emitter, tweet. Massive amount of air as linearly as possible. We don't care about frequency response. So no, you can, you can have dips and peaks, no real high Q stuff. Low distortion, massive amount of air because we're just going to EQ the crap out of it. And so every single little Sonos player, speaker out there That's what I was trying to get has to. a full okay, Linux right. PC in it <laughs> and a massive amount of DSP run inside that thing. They got 40 bucks worth of processors in those things. And it does a huge amount. And while that's not purest sound, they sell millions and millions of units a year. And that's, they're the number one selling speaker brand in the world right now. Believe it or not, Sonos is. That's an amazing thing. And it's all DSP based because it gives consumers the freedom of like, wow, you can have this little thing that sounds great and it does all these cool things. And it gives uh, manufacturers the freedom of, oh, I only have to make a transducer that simply doesn't distort. I don't have to worry about the analog pass through mode anymore, uh, which simplifies a lot of designing capabilities. And it, as we know, computers and everything's getting cheaper. The, the headphone I mentioned earlier that we did, it's got a quad core two gigahertz processor and three additional DSPs built into it. And it's an affordable product. You know, I mean, it's got more capability than a state-of-the-art Cray in 2002 supercomputer in a headphone. It's just not right, but that's what they are. So it frees you up from a consumer brand standpoint, especially for larger consumer brands. I mean, that's huge because now it makes design easier of the transducer and the acoustic system as a whole. So you can move faster. You can release new technologies quicker. You can integrate them. You have to have the two to three year design cycle simply because there's not enough engineering or money going into it. Does the Sonos approach scale? So Absolutely, it does to millions for them. No, 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 no. <laughs> Just does it scale in terms of performance? So, yeah. so you know, building. You know, so you build the drivers for the most linear behavior. Sure. You know, po linear behavior possible. Yeah. Low, low distortion, independent mm -hmm. of kind of inherent tonality. You don't worry as much about that, yeah. right? Yeah. And then, and then, but could you DSP then something like that, whether it's headphones or speakers, mm -hmm. uh, to scale to a performance level that a high-end audiophile would expect? Not, not. Meridian. Sonos is different. Meridian audio. Okay. Yeah. I don't think you have to go into that. More importantly, look at how record recordings were made in the 60s and 70s and look at how they're done now. It's all DSP with, you know, virtual 256 channel mixer boards that are run off of a 48 channel baseboard. Why? Because it's all scalable. It's all done. It already has scaled. Okay. You know, whether we want to accept it or not, it has. That's very interesting. Especially on the recording side. Right. <laughs> I think I'll channel Paul Barton here a little bit. He would say that it's it's great that you can do all these things, but you got to know what you're doing. Yes. Right, right, right. Yes. What? You got to know what the target curve is and yep. what you're trying to accomplish because you can do almost anything now. But don't give the money, monkey a machine gun. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's like entirely it. it. All right. Well, I think we should probably go to questions. Uh, sure. if anybody? Oh, this gentleman here. We're we're going to get you a microphone so you can ask the question. I have a comment and a question for you, Mark. Uh oh. <laughs> uh, so I went to uh, the SoCal Can Jam a couple months ago with my son, who's 19 years old, and we were just blown away by the Mobius. So ah, I bought him one, and I could test it for one day before I have to, you know, hand it off to him, and it's <laughs> gone. <laughs> and the, the 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 thing that amazed me most was that usually when I listen to headphones, the sounds like all inside my head. Mm -hmm. And I got goosebumps when I put this on because the sound was like in front of me. Mm -hmm. And it, it was just like a nice experience, huh. you know? Uh, now I could not care, I mean, I, I, I do not care about the sound, you know, 
staying in place because that's almost, I mean, when I listen to music, I want the sound like move with me. So I don't, I don't care about that. But my son does for the gaming stuff. Right. Yeah. So just like a big compliment to what you accomplished <laughs> with, it, with, with the headphones. And so the question that I have is, uh, you mentioned that you could correct, you know, my own hearing. You know, I'm getting old. Uh, I went to the ear doctor a while ago, and you know, he did like a you know frequency curve and whatever, and it's you know it's falling off at the high frequencies for me. Uh, it's probably you know usual aging thing. Uh, so how would I correct that with that headphone? So we'll probably have some software later on uh, next year that will more specifically address those kind of issues for listeners. But so that's something we're working on. So what would happen is you would have, uh, well, without talking too much out of school, uh, just imagine you had a two-channel parametric equalizer. So you had one for each side. Yep. And then you had a, a number of bands you could play with. And you'd also have Q, so it wouldn't just be frequency and, uh, and gain, but also Q, because mm -hmm. that's, re that's required. Because we actually found some people, uh, this is amazing, some people will have a very, very narrow band of hearing impairment. Mm -hmm. It could be just from one kilohertz to two kilohertz. Or narrower. They're narrow, right. Mm -hmm. And if you have a conventional uh, tone control, then you're taking out way too much. And so, uh, so there, will, there will be some special kind of EQ that we're working on, but that will be sometime next year. And so that'll be, that'll be a, uh, like a firmware update and an application you use with a headphone. The, the ear doctors for like hearing aid you know, measurements, they put like, like a silicon tube in, right. in, in, in my ear and then, and then they run some frequency you know, thingy, whatever. Mm -hmm. Would you do something similar? I mean, how, how, how can you tell you know, what my you know, hearing you know, oh, deficiency is? No, we've got some ideas for that. Uh, and Dan has a lot of experience on the hearing aid side, by the way. I've been doing that for way too long. Well, there's, well, there's a consumer application. One of the gentlemen was supposed to be on the panel, but he, he, he couldn't make it. He, 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 regrettably, he, he wished he could. Uh, uh, Biodynamic hmm. works with Mimi Technologies in Germany, uh, and they have something called MIY. And uh, you use an app, and you put their headphone on, and then it plays these tones that diminish in amplitude. Mm -hmm. But it's like a three-minute per ear test, and I swear to goodness, I cannot stay awake. No. through the whole thing because because it's so quiet and you're listening for the t and I start falling asleep <laughs> every time yeah. and that I struggle to get to the end of, of each ear but you 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 hold down your thumb until you don't hear it anymore yeah. and then or is it the other way anyways but you, yeah. you essentially yeah and uh, if you can get to the end which I have done finally like once because <laughs> um, it lasts six minutes yeah. and yeah, it's yeah. quite relaxing because remember they're playing it at the very bottom you know they're trying to get to where you can't hear it anymore so it's quite quiet and it's relaxing for me. So anyways, and I'm always sleep deprived. So uh, I got through it, and the, for me, the effect was fairly subtle. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if you talk to others, the effect is a little bit more dramatic. Yeah, there was a, just a review of that, I think, in the latest Hi-Fi News magazine out of the UK, which was not extraordinarily positive. Now, you did touch on something uh, very early in your comment about the depth of the headphone. So this is something that can happen for all of you listening on headphones, and that is people will try headphones with 3D effect, and many of them will say, well, wait a minute. Yeah, I hear the 3D, but I don't hear this distance in front of me. Well, part of the problem is the product, the, probably the original program material hasn't really been mixed for that effect. Mm -hmm. For example, you, know, you tend to think, oh, if someone's sitting 6 to 10 feet in front of me, I should hear that distance. Well, unfortunately, there's this thing called the Haas effect. Yep. Something needs to be about 30 feet away, or about 30 milliseconds, before your brain realizes it's different. <laughs> it's not in the same place. So if someone doesn't set the original perspective or de delay, let's say there's the lead vocal's in the center, it's panned there. If they didn't set a delay of 30 plus milliseconds, you'll, you'll never perceive that as being more than this far away from you. So, that, so most of the problem with that tends to be on the recorded music side, not on 
the DSP or reproduction side of all that. So we'll see that maybe change more in the future, especially more people are mixing their products for VR and AR applications. So as a sound mixer, you're starting to treat your objects as 3D objects in space rather than, is it gonna be from left to right as I'm panning my, uh, my drum kit, for example. Mm -hmm. So different, different things coming up over the next few years. Any other questions? Uh, I, I would say I have some um, purist leanings. Um, unlike Jude, I don't EQ. My, my idea of EQ is reaching for a different pair of headphones. Right? Yep. That's, that's my EQ. We like people like you. I, I <laughs> like people like products. me. So, <laughs> and, right? and I understand that certain applications like gaming and, and AR and VR where uh, DSP is crucial, absolutely crucial. Um, but for someone that isn't necessarily focused on that and just wants to listen to mm -hmm. music, and again, I, I understand the event never happened. Yep. Right? For someone like me who says, okay, I understand that it was recorded in a certain way, it was mastered in a certain way, it was mixed in a certain way, but I want the molestation to stop there and go no further. Mm -hmm. What are the most tangible benefits that DSP has to offer someone like me? If you're not gonna molest the audio signal, then by definition, it's everything that's not audio. It would be transparency features. It would be noise cancellation. It would be, Augmentation, when I was doing Doppler Labs, you know, we, the whole idea was we were putting smart computers in your ear. Um, the ability to do things like um, uh, layover information as a background information. So you listen to some great, you know, Stravinsky as you're walking through the airport, and it says, you know, you got 17 minutes to get to your gate and turn, take the next left. You don't have to go, where am I going? It just tells you that kind of information. So the ability to augment what you're hearing on top of your pure music is where DSP starts fitting in. Although, not, not necessarily too make the music better. Correct, not necessarily to make the music better because if you're a purist you don't want to don't want to doink with the music then by definition you're not going to let DSP do that in the first place. So what else is it going to do? It is going to do things like you know it, so a lot of the room and the HRTF stuff goes away. It comes down to well just get rid of the non-music stuff from me I think is the big thing with noise cancellation. DSP's gotten much better with noise cancellation um, and uh, transparency bringing the outside world that I want into me. Or, that correction, or hearing correction even. I mean, is that really molestation at that point? I mean, if it's, yeah. if it's uh, uh, tuned to someone's actual hearing deficits, right? Uh, it, that's an interesting one. We can talk yeah, about that. That's okay. a whole, that that, is an audiology is a whole other world. I could talk about that for hours. <laughs> I think if I were ever confronted with something like that, I would almost, and I hate to say this, I'd almost just sit there and accept whatever the deficiency was. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, <laughs> and ultimately, yeah, yeah we, we all kind of do that. that. I mean, I, you know, the problem with perfectionists is there's no such thing as perfection. Right, that's right. Yeah. It's a fool's errand. So, you know, really what we use DSP for is to optimize what we have. Yes. So, you know, there are all different parameters. And like you were saying, Sonos could get a drive route, moved a lot of the air, but wasn't super linear. But that's not a problem because you wouldn't find a super linear driver that could move a lot of the air that was that size. Mm -hmm. So there are trade-offs involved and you get the best result mm -hmm. uh, you can from that. Or the headphone you're working on a very small space, that's, that's not gonna work acoustically, but you can make it work with DSP. Exactly. So, uh, and I think the way we're looking at it at PSB right now is really to perfect what we have. So you have to start with something that's very good to begin with, but mm -hmm. then you can polish it. It's, it's a level of polish on an already good product that takes it from being you know, just very good to outstanding uh, is the way we're using it. But there are many other uses as well. And actually, I had a fair amount of empathy for Warren's uh, position. If you notice with Odyssey, we have a number of headphones that we don't screw around with with DSP at all. And we have some headphones that are purposely voiced slightly on the warm side of neutral, like our LCD 2 and 3, and others that are neutral, like the LCD X or the, X or the LCD 4. So people like Warren can say, this is the kind of headphone I want or I want for this music. And then what we do with DSP is if people want to deal with it, they can go through Reveal, for example. But we don't that make that a gotcha or a have to. We have another question in the back. So this is coming from, I am of the younger generation, obviously. And I love this hobby. I grew up with Hi-Fi Audio and I have struggled to share this hobby with my colleagues, with my friends. Do you guys think, and I think Audis is probably thinking down this route with their 
gaming headset. Um, do you guys think that bringing in DSP and some of these other features that DSP enables, like the, the noise cancellation, the, the transparency features, even stuff like the surround sound, do you think that will help bring younger generations into this hobby? Yes. Any other answer? <laughs> I, I say no. <laughs> because ultimately this hobby, <laughs> I, I think ultimately this hobby is about music. And adding effects on, on music or you know, a realism to music to somebody who's really not into music is irrelevant. If you want to bring people into the hobby, you have to get them excited about music. The way I get people excited about what I'm doing is, and where I believe things are supposed to go and all my various little audio hobbies I play with and things like that is, hey, did you hear this new song from? You got to listen to this cut. You got to listen to that. Suddenly they start going, wow, wow, that's great. I've never heard of this artist. Who's that artist? What are they doing? You start talking about music. And then suddenly people are like, I like this. But how can I listen to music when I'm not at home? Ha ha, we've created this thing called a headphone. And take it with you. So I think that's the, the big hook there is get people super excited about music and the rest just follows. And then they start getting into music and they get started headphones. So they start going, well, I want it to sound different. What if it could sound like it's in my house? What if I want to turn off that airplane noise, but I still want to be able to click a button and hear the flight attendant when they say, do you want your coffee or not kind of a thing, right? right. That's when they start looking for those features. But I think just putting those features in front of somebody and say, hey, look, this headphone does all these things. They're like, well, I don't care because I don't use headphones anyway, because I'm not even listening to the music. That's, that's the core of the product, right? But you know, I think what changed, you know, music is interesting because it's one of the only activities that totally lights up the brain. Yes. I mean, every aspect of your brain is, is operational when you're listening to music. So it is a really immersive experience. And, um, but you know, it only has that effect if it's really well presented. Mm -hmm. And you know, from a, I would say from a purist point of view. If you don't hear all the details, then you're missing a lot of what's going on there. Um, I've been wor we've been working a little bit with Neil Young. He's a big advocate for high resolution music. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's his point, is that you know, he, he puts down the music and he wants his, his stands to hear exactly what he did. And you know, when you get much closer, you get that uh, immediacy and that connection with the artist that just makes the musical experience much, much richer. So I would say that's not a DSP issue, but more of a, a basic music loving. Uh. I had a good friend who really wasn't into headphones and not much into music. And then I let him listen to some tracks. He's like, that's a change. I said, well, listen to him on these. Listen to this. And he's like, wow, I've never heard that before. And then it's like, well, what's your favorite song? Well, I like this song. From I I'd never heard those kind of things before. Started to realize, oh, I really do like music. I didn't like music until I actually got a chance to listen to some decent headphones. So it all starts with music quality in the first place and getting to like music in the first place. Then all these extra things add on and create, wow, now I see this whole experience, this world that opens up to me beyond. Is it time for one last question, that gentleman right there? Back to uh, individual hearing differences. I wear hearing aids and I'm wondering whether I should just take them off, put on a great headphone transducer, and fiddle with my 11-band parametric equalizer to get it right, or leave the hearing aids on and put on a good transducer. I mean, I, I'm not getting to it. I got DSP all over my ears right now. Yeah. And if I had some more, uh, what, what right. approach would you take? So here's the question. Are you wearing your hearing aids so you can listen to music or so you can have this conversation? Well, I've got a music setting, I've got a speech setting. That's right. So I Most, put it on music. Okay. It's you got really it. is flatter. Okay. Right. You put typically, but a lot of times you're using it simply so you can understand communication yes, from others right. with you. Yeah. Hearing aids are inherently not about accuracy. They're about intelligibility. Yes. And, you know, that's rule number one. So I would say get a good set of headphones that are equalizable, you know, that you could tune. When you want to listen to music, pull your hearing aids off, put the headphones on. Okay. But anytime you're out and about, I would absolutely have your hearing aids because there is so much processing that goes into those processors now. The DSP inside, like a little on, like the latest generation, the 7400 series on from, and on semi, I'm geeking out. Um, 55, 60 dB of gain in narrow, very narrow bands of, of literally a 10th or a 12th of an octave. So they can do some great things. And they'll have 12 to 15 bands of compression going on inside of it too, to limit what you're going on. So the, the headphones are woefully inadequate when it comes to that kind of processing capability. 
to do that kind of detail right and now. also have it fitted by an audiologist who actually knows you've seen the fitting sheets like you yes. know yeah yes. on, on the house 7000 programming set it it's not easy at all there's 9000 little check boxes somebody who knows how to do that so that you can hear when they ask do you want fries with it i mean that's ultimately what it boils down to so i would say you need both um, a great set of hearing aid, uh, of, of hearing uh, of, of headphones where you need to listen to music tune it how you want to listen to it around and about the world to be able to interact with the world, absolutely hearing aids. But I don't mean, have the hearing aids set to natural or, or music and then use headphones. No, no, I wouldn't yeah. do that at all. I wouldn't do that at all. I think that's no. going to, no. That'll uh, screw everything up. Yeah, plus yeah. you're not listening to the headphones. You're simply <laughs> listening to the balanced armatures in your, in your hearing aids, and that's a whole different no. world we could talk about <laughs> because that's really what's driving the sound that you're hearing at that point. I would, I would look at some good, good um, uh, headphones that are programmable and then some really good hearing aids. And there, there are third-party software applications that have parametric equal, equalization that you can play with. You don't yeah. need to buy Odyssey or anybody else's per, particular headphone, at least at this point. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Well, yeah. thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for being on this panel. And thanks for, thank you. for showing up. Thank you.